year ago tomorrow, I preached my first sermon with you all. Was that the audition preaching or the one after? <laughs> no, that was the real one. <laughs> the parking lot. No, actually, that one was, um, was in front of the camera. I was the only one here. I, had to, I, I remember I set up some chairs and wasn't quite sure how. I was trying to, I fought with the camera on the phone, trying to get the cross in the background. If you know some older years ago, I'm on that conquest. <laughs> but man, what God has done in you with us all, right? God is good. Amen. Get your Bibles turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31. We're going to be reading verses 31 through 34. And this is how it reads. It says, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this Lenten season, as we've been journeying towards Resurrection Sunday, uh, we've been taking a, a rather different approach, haven't we? we? We haven't been looking at the traditional gospel passages, uh, you know, of, of, of the stories of Jesus leading up to the cross and up to the, the empty tomb. We've been looking in the Old Testament at places where God is saying to us, never again. And... Those, the, the, what, what Jesus endures for us and what he goes through at the cross and leading up to it, even, even at, during his resurrection, that fulfills those never again statements found in the Old Testament. You see, the Bible is connected. From Genesis to Revelation, the entire Word of God speaks about the story of salvation. It talks about how much God loves you how, and how reckless that love is and to what extreme your God will go to to rescue you. And so we, as we look at these Nowhere Again statements, that's what we've been looking at. And so today, in today's passage, we're going to be reading here in Jeremiah, trying to answer the question of, who is supposed to go to God for me? So we're looking at verses 31 and 32 here. Jeremiah is, is, is writing on behalf of God. God has spoken to his spirit, and now he's writing these words down. And God's saying to him, I'm, I'm, I will make a new covenant with Israel. It's not going to be like the old one we have because they messed up. They broke it. But I'm going to make a new one with them. Jeremiah was a prophet that lived through a very dark period in the history of, of God's people. He was there when the Jerusalem fell. He had warned the people was coming. He ain't even gone to King Zedekiah and said, hey, the, the enemy is coming, but you're not going to succeed in defending the city. They're going to break through the gates, and they're going to come looking for you. And the only way that you can save yourself is if you surrender. But Zedekiah didn't do that. Zedekiah, he takes off, he runs off into the fields, and he and his sons, and it doesn't take long for the enemy to capture them. And, and the rest of the story is very tragic. Jeremiah was there for that. But before Jeremiah gets to that point, before he has to go through that, 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 those dark days, before the enemy begins to show up, before the threats of the enemy even begin to take hold over the, the nation, at the very beginning of Jeremiah's ministry, he is a part of something special that's 
that is attempting to be taken place in that nation. See, before Jeremiah take, accepts his call to ministry, except he accepts the, the life that God has for him five years before King Josiah attempts to, to spur a national revival. See, the nation of God's people, they were wishy-washy. They would follow God with one king, and that king would die, and then a new king would come in, and they would follow something else. Then a new king would come, and they would be back to following God again, and it's back and forth. But when King Josiah comes to the throne, he's had enough. He, he, he understands that because of the way his people have been behaving, the way they have been behaving as a nation, God was upset with them because they were worshiping something other than God. And so he decides, you know, I am the king, and I recognize that we have messed up, we have sinned against God. And so to be a good leader, I am going to lead by example, and we are going to cast down these idols. And since I can make the rules, I am going to make rules in favor of God, hoping that maybe if we all turn from our wickedness and follow God's law, maybe these bad things won't happen. And Jeremiah, our prophet, who, who, who was there and witnesses the destruction of the city, he is there when this attempt at national revival begins. He's there. He has the unfortunate reality of watching what was meant to be the flames of revival become the flames of destruction. What happens? What goes wrong? You see, while King Josiah was alive and making the rules and then heading this, the movement, the people followed him. They lived their lives like they were living for God, but the second King Josiah was not on the throne anymore. They go right back to their own place. You see, Josiah, he, he, used, his, he used his political influence and means to, ignite, to, to try and start this revival. But it didn't work. Because all a king can do is influence the external behavior. That's all he did. He was attempting to, to spark at something deep within the heart of the people to where they would turn their hearts to God. But all they really did was follow the rules simply to make the king happy. So that the king wouldn't punish them. So that they would be in good favor with him in case they needed something. They weren't really truly repentant. They were simply going through the motions. They had no real desire to change. And so they, they would follow the rules, rules as a group and they, they'd have slogans that would pump up the crowds. But they neglected what was truly necessary for a national revival to take place. For a national revival to take place. For, for a nation to be changed, revival has to start with personal commitment. You see, at the heart of any nation, at the heart of any organization, at the heart of any church, it doesn't matter what it is, when you get a group of people, at the heart of that, what, what is the, what, what the most valuable piece of it, the most important thing, is the person. The person. Because without the person, you do not have a group. You need a bunch of persons to make a group, but it starts on the person. So for a national revival to take place, it has to start with each person, a part of that group, a part of that nation, surrendering their heart to God, making that personal commitment within themselves for it to take place. And because, because they, they, the king couldn't legislate that, because the king couldn't force that to happen, all the people did was go through the motions externally without ever experiencing God in you. That was the old covenant. God had made a promise to his people that, hey, if you obey my commandments, if you love me and live for me and honor me, then I will bless you. And they couldn't keep up the ears of the bargain. You see, the mistake when we read passages like this, we think that because of their sin, God broke off the covenant with them. That's not what happens. God didn't break the covenant. God never let go of the promise of the covenant. The covenant was broken because the people chose sin 
over God. The people broke the covenant. Our God is faithful. He is always faithful. Our God is, God is always going to lead us to our salvation. But we have to choose Him. That was the old covenant. So God tells Jeremiah, I'm going to reform the way that you go about bringing reform. You see, the way, that's the way the Israelites have always done it. That's the way God's people have always done this. The way they tried to reform themselves was, was based on who the leader was at the top. If it was just God's man at the top, then it would flow down, right? That was their theory. But it didn't work. And if it did work, it worked only short term until the leader changed. And God, so God's telling Jeremiah, I am going to change the way that you try to change things. Instead of, instead of you making rules externally so that people can only go through the motions, I am going to take my law and I am going to put right it upon your heart and put it in your mind. God, but God is telling Jeremiah here in verse 33, he's saying, I, I'm going to put it in such a way where you don't just remember it. You don't just simply remember what my rules say. You don't just simply think about what my word says. says. I am going to take my law, and I am going to place it into the very DNA of who you are. Where it is a part of you. At the very heart of the person. See, on Mount Sinai, with that old covenant, what, how, how did God go about writing the Ten Commandments? He took a stone tablet, right? He wrote the Ten Laws on there. The people could look, and they could see what the Ten Rules were. They could see what it said. But just being able to see what the law says does nothing to impact your behavior. Just seeing the law, that they knew that God had expectations for them. They knew that to fail to live up to God's expectations was sin. But it did nothing to help them to be able to live up to that. They were still left in the same brokenness that they were in. And all the law did was expose how broken they were. And, but the people, they knew that God doesn't like it when they sin. So, so to keep God happy with them and to keep the blessings coming, what they do, they follow the rules. They follow the rules to simply keep, 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 keep God happy and keep the blessings coming. You see, that's not love, is it? That's not love. When we're doing things out of duty to get something from it, that is taking what was meant to be a, a, a relational thing, that was taking what was meant to be love and turning it into something that we use to get what we want. The nation of God's people, they had taken... God's promised them and used it as a means to get what they wanted from God without having to actually commit to following them. They were going through all the motions. They had even been following all of God's commandments. But they were doing it from a selfish attitude. Um, God, this is what's in, it, what's in it for me. But what God is saying is, in verse 33, He says, I will put my law on their minds and write it on their hearts. He's saying He's going to take His law, His way, and He's going to put it so deep within their being that it will become the natural expression of how they love Him. It'll be just like taking a breath. It'll just be like standing up and walking around. It'll be like blinking your eyes. Loving God and following His law is just a part of who you are. That, if you look at verse 34, notice it says, They will all know me. That word no. It means 
find it. It means to know by observing, reflecting, and to know by experiencing. It means they have seen God's law. They have read it. They, 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 have, they, have, they have acknowledged what it said here. But then all, something different has happened. They have watched others around them who follow this law, this, these ways of God. And they've seen something happen. They've seen the grace of God change them. There's something different about them. They, they, they don't, they're not quite sure what it is, but there's something going on deep within their being that, is, that has made them not the same. And then beyond that, just, beyond just knowing God's word and, and seeing it happening in others, at some point, to know means to experience that encounter for yourself. So what God is telling Jeremiah is that his people, one day, they would experience God for themselves. They wouldn't have to go to the high priest and have the high priest make sacrifices for them. No. They would experience God in their own heart, in their own mind, and in their own life. And that experience would change them to the very core of who they are as a person. See, it's a person seeing God's law and reflecting on why it is good, but then experiencing His goodness for themselves. And what makes God good? It's the end of verse 34. It says, For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Knowing God means that you know that you're a broken, messed up sinner, that you've made a, a lifetime of bad decisions, you've been following a lifetime of bad patterns established in your life. But knowing that when you see God, when you experience in your life, you realize that He has already forgiven you for all that. That you can stand, you're standing in His presence and, and to know that God loves you and has already forgiven you for all of your brokenness. That's what makes him good. That's what makes his law good. And it's because of this radical love. This experience that shocks you to the core of who you are. It's because of that that you live out the law to demonstrate your own love to God. And this is the new covenant that, that God is talking about to his people. He's saying you're going to experience me in such a way that it will change who you are at the very core of your beings. And when people see you, they will know who you are because of the way that you love others and the way that you love me. This is a little, little sidebar. You see, we spend so much time when we study the book of Revelation and times and things like that about the Bible. We're trying to figure out you know, things like the mark of the beast and what can get us in trouble. But if you realize that the entire message of the Bible is telling you something greater. The entire book of Revelation is telling you something greater. Stop, it's telling you to stop worrying about whether you have the mark of the beast and start worrying about whether you are wearing Christ's mark of love of your life. Because it's that mark of love that you, of Christ that changes the world. And when Christ changes, when I talk about Christ changing the world, it starts with God changing the life of one person. So what does this have to do with the idea of a middleman or, or answering our question of who is supposed to go to God for me? It's unraveled in our understanding of, of God, what God is saying to Jeremiah about the Old Covenant. You see, the Old Covenant only promoted reform. But it did not didn't do enough to bring about revival. You see, God gave us those ten commandments so we know what his expectations are. But to live up to God's expectations is more than simply following the rules. It's really a hint upon that, that the two greatest commandments that Jesus shares of love God and love others. It has to come with a genuine, real, authentic love for God and love for other people. It can't be, you can't be following God's laws because you're afraid of the consequences if you don't. And when we're afraid of God, when we're afraid of the consequences, we can't know God. Because fear is the roadblock 
that intimacy. Go back to the story in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve sinned. God doesn't take Adam and Eve and hide them from him, does he? They were so afraid of God because of what they'd done that they went from him on, on their own. They were so afraid of the consequences of what might happen when God found out that they went and hid from him. And not only that, now they were exposed to one another. They knew who each other really were. And so not only did they have to hide from God, but because they were afraid the other one might turn them into God, they had to hide from each other. Fear destroys relationships. You cannot be in a healthy relationship and be afraid. And the same can be said of God. You cannot be in a healthy relationship with God. You cannot know Him if it's based on fear. It doesn't negate that there are consequences for sin. It doesn't, I'm not saying that hell doesn't exist. What I'm saying is when you follow God, it's more about knowing, it, 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 there's more to it than just knowing where you will go when you die. It's more, it's more than living in fear of, oh, if, I make, if I make that one mistake, I'm, I'm blotted out of the land of the book of life and I'm, I'm going to hell. It's more than that. But see, that the law couldn't produce it. The law could do nothing to help you. All of it reminds you of this is what God's expectations are. But you see, the way of grace, which is that new covenant, it's all based on God. And the fact that he has forgiven us of sin. I'm here to tell you this morning, church, each and every one of you here, you are forgiven of your sin by God right now. Even if you choose to reject it, that is on you because God's forgiveness, and the work of forgiveness is complete, it's done. The choice is yours alone to accept it or to reject it. But it doesn't change it. It doesn't undo the work. It doesn't stop it. it. The work that Jesus did for you on the cross is complete. You are forgiven. It is your sin that makes you fear God. It's your sinfulness that keeps you from coming to Him. However, when, there's something special when we see God's forgiveness change someone. When we see that work of God go, happen in the life of somebody else, it draws our attention. We say to ourselves, if there is hope for them, if God can, can speak into their life and change them from the inside out, then maybe there is hope for me. I think I told you guys this story before. When I, I was I, I was married before with uh, Nicole, and uh, I went through a, a divorce. And there was a point where my life was so dark, and, and the darkest time it was so thick that I could not feel God's presence. I knew He was there. I knew He was real. I didn't I didn't doubt Him. I didn't go off and do things, you know, that were, that were wicked. I just couldn't feel God in my life because the pain was so intense. And, and some dumb pastor said, Jason, I want you to work with the teenagers. I use the word dumb in quotation marks. <laughs> I want you to work with the teenagers. And I, and I just taught them the Bible. I taught them straight as it is. I am a youth pastor that you would like. I would tell them the stories that you don't want to tell them. That you don't want them to know. We would talk about things in this Bible that you don't talk about with him. But we talked about it anyway. And God began to stir in those teenagers. God's grace began to change their lives. And, and, I, and you know, I couldn't feel him in my own life at that point in time. As I was watching God do this radical transformation in the life of this young people, I thought, if God is really moving in their life, he has to be somewhere near close to me, so I'm going to keep going. See, when we see God stir and move in other people's lives, it, it sparks something within us. And then at some point you experience it in your own life, and, it, and the love is overwhelming. It comes in over you like a tidal wave, and a wave of outrage just keeps crashing over you, and you don't know what else to say, but you just feel this intense passion. This intense love is that, that you can't even describe with words. But you know it's of God. And when that experience 
experience happens. It does something. It changes you on the inside. And it's, you stop going to church because it's the right thing to do. You stop reading your Bible because it's the right thing to do. You stop praying because that's what you're supposed to. You start doing all those things because you want to be in God's presence and you don't care how you do it. You don't care how it happens. You just want to get to where he is. That's what grace does. And that's the new covenant that, that God is talking about through Jeremiah. So what, who is, So the question we're answering today is, who is supposed to go to God for me? Verse 34 tells you. It says, No longer will man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, No to the Lord, because they will all know me. What God is saying right here is, Never again do you have to go through, through anybody else to know God for yourself. That God is real and He's available for you right now. You can go to God. You see, we think to ourselves the same way that the Jews do did in this passage. We think, well, maybe we can just get the right president or the right people in Congress. Or if we could just get our political enemies converted to our side, then guess what? Then the national revival can happen. We're trying to use a middle person to get to God. We're saying that God can just change that person over there, then guess what? I'm going to experience him. But what God is saying is if you really want the Bible to happen, if you, would, if you really want the Bible to happen, then just go to Jesus just as you are. And all of your brokenness, and all of your filth, and all of your, your unhealthiness, and all of your sins, just go to him directly as you are and allow his love to change you. He wants to change the world by starting, by starting with changing you. National revival, societal revival begins with you going to Jesus. It starts with you. When we, when we quote that verse from 2 Chronicles, if my people would humble themselves and pray, you are God's people. You personally. Yes, it's called for all of us to pray together, but it has to start with you. If you want to see your Bible, come to this country again. To come to this community again. To come to this church next weekend. It has to start in your heart and in your mind right now. That has to start with you. You have to go to God. You don't believe me? Jesus is the proof of all this. He proves the point. Jesus is God in the flesh. And he came and he died. We couldn't get to God, so what did Jesus do? He came to us. God came to us and died so we could get to him. One of my favorite verses in scripture that when it comes to the, to the, the passion of Christ is when, when he takes his last breath on the cross, there's a temple, that, there's a veil in the temple that separated man from God. And only the white priest could go in there. But the second Jesus died, the second he took his last breath, God was in such a hurry to get to you, to get into our presence, to be with us, that he tore that temple veil. When I say, when I'm talking about here, I'm not talking about your little fabric here from Walmart. I'm talking about this is like triple thick, extra strong stuff. And he tore it was like it was nothing, just to get to you. He, and, he did, and he did that to show you, to tell you that you don't have to go to anybody else. You don't have to come to the pastor. You don't have to go to your Sunday school teacher. You don't have to read all the self-help books. What Jesus is telling you, what he shows us, what God demonstrates to us through his word is, just come to me. I am here. Come just as you are. Stop being afraid of your sin. Stop being afraid of the consequences of your sin. God loves you and has forgiven you. Go to him. And allow his love to change you. And if you allow his love to change you, his love through you will change this church, it will change this community, it will change your co-workers, it will change everybody around you. But it has to start with you. 
This morning we're going to close our time together by taking communion. And I'm going to do it a lot differently today. So you know I stand up here and flip all pretty with the can on my hand. And you come up the middle aisle and you take the plate and you sit back in your seat and we all take it together. Right? That's how we do it. We've only done it four times together. That's how we've done it so far. Today I'm not doing that. Today I am not going to stand between you and God's table. Because I can't. I can't make the decision for you to come to Jesus. Believe me, I want to as your pastor. I want to make the decision for you because I have experienced the love of Jesus deep within my being. And has transformed me from the inside out. I want you to experience that too. But I can't do it for you. I can't. I want your Bible to come to this church and to this nation. But I can't do it by myself. Because I can't change all that one person I can change is myself. And I can help God change you by sharing him with you. But it all rests on you making the decision to come to Jesus just as you are. So this morning, I'm going to play a song. And that's the song plays. I want you to make the choice when you are ready to come up and say, Jesus, here I am just, just as I am. I want you to come up. I want you to take this communion cup for yourself. I want you to spend time with him and you about what it means. I want you and him to have that conversation. I want you to take it when you're ready, and then when you're done, when, you're, when you've taken it, and you feel like your time with God is over, then you're free to go. But it's on you today. Now, I would love you up here. If you, if you say, Pastor, I need some of your prayers with me. I, I'm so broken today. I need help. Will you help me pray? Then come get your communion. Come, come sit in one of these chairs up on the platform. I'll come and pray with you. But as the song plays, you make the decision to come just as you are.